Say, this is my Bible. I have what it says I can have. I can do what it says I can do. It is inerrant, infallible, incorruptible. Today, I will be taught the word of God that will go into the soul of my heart and produce not 30, not 60, but a hundredfold. I decree my mind is attentive. My heart is receptive. I shall, I must, I will be changed in Jesus' name. God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Oh, we love you tonight. Have your way, God. Have your way. Amen. You can be seated. In the presence of the Lord. Amen. Well, tonight we're continuing the teaching. It's been a couple of weeks since I was up here. Minister Kenny did a phenomenal job last week talking about spiritual growth. Amen. Tonight we're getting back into identifying demon spirits and their function. Identifying demon spirits and their function. Our foundational scripture was coming from Ephesians 6 and 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers, rulers of... Okay, you got that. So we began talking about these specific spirits on last week. We began talking about the jealous spirit. So there's a spirit of jealousy that can be found in Numbers chapter 5, verse 14. Then we talked about the evil spirit, and we found that in 1 Samuel 16, 14 through 15. And then we talked about the lying spirit. There is a lying spirit. Some of you know people that have a lying spirit. Hopefully you don't have a lying spirit. Amen? Amen. So we're not making these spirits up. These are real spirits that the Bible specifically lists. Then we talked about uh, Ecclesiastes 7 and 8. There is a spirit of pride, a proud spirit. Amen. That spirit is having or showing a high or excessive high opinion of oneself or one's importance. Then we talked about there is a destroying spirit. There is a spirit of a destroyer. That was in Jeremiah 5 and 1, I believe. Yeah, 51 and 1. Yeah, 51 and 1. Then we talked about the whoring spirit. That's what y'all called it. <laughs> the spirit of holotry, amen, that was found in Hosea 4 and 12. The spirit of whoredom or holotry. Then we talked about the spirit of falsehood. Falsehood, amen. Then we talked about the unclean spirit that was in, Jer in uh, Zechariah 13 and 2. And we concluded talking about a foul spirit, Mark 9 and 25. Let's go back over there. That's where we'll pick back up tonight. Mark chapter 9. Verse number 25. And I'm reading from the New King James Version tonight. Mark 9 and 25. When you have it, say, I have it. I have it. All right. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. The spirit cried out and convulsed him greatly and came out of him. So here's the the young child or the young man that is um, being tormented by this spirit cast into the fire, cast into the water, and Jesus called him an unclean spirit. So we said that the unclean, is, it can be ceremonial, it can um, be based on the Levitical law, but from a moral sense, unclean in thought and life. Say unclean, unclean. In, thought in thought and life. And life. So there are some people that have unclean spirits and seeming like their thought life is just messed up. Because if a person's thought life is messed up, then their life is going to be messed up. So 
That's where we concluded last week. So let's go over here to Isaiah chapter 61. And drop down to the third verse, Isaiah 61 and 3. When you have it, say, I have it. It says, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit, highlight, circle, underline, spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. So there is a spirit of heaviness. If you look that word heaviness up in the Hebrew, it means doom. It means gloom. It means darkness. It means a weight. So there are times in even a believer's life where they begin to experience this heaviness. You ever experience it? It's like a darkness try to come over you, like gloom, and, and there's nothing to be dark about. There's nothing to be gloomy about, but this thing tries to settle on you. And the Bible gives us the answer here that we are to put on the garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Praise is the key to depression. Praise is the key to oppression. No matter what life or the enemy is trying to put on us, Amen. if we would lose ourselves in praise yes. and worship, we'll break out of it. Yes. And so pity does not remove the spirit of heaviness. Talking to people about what you're going through does not remove the spirit of heaviness. Yes, it's some good to talk to some people sometimes. But how I many know at the end of the day, people can't help you? Even if you go see a psychiatrist or a psychologist, they can listen to you, but they're just listening to you. They can't really do anything to change your mood or your, your predicament. But the Bible says that we are to put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaven. So that's something we have to initiate. That's not something God is going to do. We have to put this garment on. And it is a blessing that we have access to praise and worship so we can get out of this situation. Amen. But I want you to know why I threw this one in here. I added this, that heaviness is a spirit. And I don't care who you are, how anointed you are, this spirit will try to visit you. Your anointing doesn't exempt you from this spirit. You ever just been minding your own business, all of a sudden you start feeling heavy and then like depression try to come on you and you're like, hold up now, what is this? You trying to analyze it. Like my bills pay, my, my marriage going good, kids acting right. You be like, what is going on? It's a spirit. It is a spirit of heaviness that is trying to rest on you. And you got to, you can't see the thing about it, you can't stay there alone. You got to shake yourself. You got to begin to get up and begin to eulogize the Lord. Some of y'all just, you entertain too much. You entertain this stuff and you don't tell it to go back where it came from. I was listening to um, Keith Moore yesterday and he was talking about it was a preacher that I guess it was like a field trip. They, they went to this one of the highest buildings in this particular state and they were up like on the top floor and he was looking over and the people looked like ants down there and say so he heard a voice say, won't you jump? Now this is a preacher. He said, I heard a voice say, won't you jump? And he said, say, what? He said, what, won't you jump? He said, won't you jump? <laughs> That's how you deal with the devil. You don't entertain him. You jump. You kill yourself. I'm not killing myself because that didn't come from the Lord. I mean, no, the Lord will never tell you to kill yourself or kill somebody else. Depression is not of God. And so if you don't learn how to put on the garment of praise, it, it is hard. Believe me, I've done it before. It is hard to be depressed and say, Lord, you're good. Lord, I just worship you. I honor you. I glorify you, God. 
Oh, how excellent is your name in all the earth, God. It, it, it is impossible to stay depressed and put on that garment of praise. But there's so many people that just entertain the voices. You ain't going to win. You're not going to get out of this. Look how bad it is. It's not getting better. And then you be like, yeah, you're right. Who right? The devil that's talking to you? He is the father of lies. How do you know the devil is lying? He's opening his mouth. He can't tell the truth. There's no truth in him. And so you know he's lying because he's talking. Everything he says is a lie. And so when he started telling you this stuff, you got to learn how to respond. One of the worst things you can do when the enemy is talking is just sit there and don't talk back. That's the conversation that needs to be had. You need to talk back and be like, huh? And like, okay, since you want to talk crazy to me, let me talk good to you. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my rock. He is my hiding place. He is the shield and the buckler. He's the fairest of 10,000. He is the Lord of the host of angels. He is the ancient of days. He's the wheel in the middle of the wheel. He's the rose of Sharon. He's the lily of the valley, the bright morning star. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. You want to go there? Let's go there. Oh, it won't be long before you, you're talking to yourself. Because demons cannot stay in the company of people that begin to eulogize God, begin to speak well of God. So there is a spirit of heaviness. Thank you, Lord. Go over to Luke chapter 13, verse 11. I can stay on that one right there all night. I feel so good when apostles do it. No, you got to do it. I can't, I, can't, I can't praise them for you. You got to praise them for yourself. I, ooh, we can just keep going, apostle. Well, You're going to have to learn how to do this at home. You can't let that devil get a foothold. Luke 13, you there? Let's start at verse 10. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity. A what? Underline, highlight, circle, spirit of infirmity. 18 years. That's almost two decades. And was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. But when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said to her, Woman, you are loose from your infirmity. And he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. She had a spirit of what? Infirmity. Infirmity. Now, let me see here. That word in the Greek is asthenia, A-S-T-H-E-N-E-I-A. And it means feebleness of mind or body. By implication, morally um, fertile, um, fra- fragile, disease, infirmity, sickness, weakness. So let's just say this right here. Every sickness is a result of the fall or the curse. Right? Every sickness is not a demon. Sickness entered into the world because of the curse. Right? Everybody that is battling sickness don't have a demon. But the devil is behind it. Because if there was no curse, then there wouldn't be any sickness. Adam and Eve didn't get sick before they messed up. And so there are some sicknesses that are directly connected to a spirit. A spirit of infirmity. And so people who talk crazy like, well... We, we don't deal with demons today and, and, you know, and then some fool say it's God's will for me to be sick. 
Why would Jesus take 39 stripes upon his back that was for the healing of the nation and, and redeemed us from sickness and disease and it be God's will for you to be sick? That's a lie and that is ignorance of the word of God. But I want to hit on this because there are some sicknesses. People go to the doctor and the doctor like, we ran every test we can run. We don't know what to tell you. On the machine, in the labs, there's nothing wrong. But this person knows something is going on with them. That's not natural. That's a spirit. That's a spirit of infirmity. That thing needs to be cast out. Notice when he cast that spirit of infirmity out, the lady stood up. What was keeping her from standing up? The spirit of the infirmity had her bent over. But when he laid hands on her and she was healed, she stood up. Because the spirit was gone. There are some people, as soon as the spirit is gone, they experience immediate relief. Immediate relief. Because there is a spirit of infirmity. I believe with everything in me that counsel is straight from the pit of hell. I believe that it is a demon. And it is probably the, the, the strongest demon in that family of spirits of infirmity. Because when people hear that, just that word. And, and listen, some people don't even have to hear. They don't, they don't even have to hear. They just start expecting something is wrong. Yep. And what happens? That fear grips them. Yep. I remember um, Pastor Nancy telling the story about her late husband, Ed DeFrancis, and said he had went to the doctor for a checkup. And they ran some tests, and they came back and told him he had cancer. And he said he felt that spirit started his feet and come all the way up over him. And so he, he was like, okay. So he was talking to God. He said, God, what's going on? I believe in divine health. I believe in healing. And God said, it's some things that I told you to get in order and take care of. You didn't do it. And the Lord said, if you do what I told you to do and get that stuff in order, the counselor will go. Well, he did what the Lord told him to do. And and, you know, he went back for a follow up and they ran some more tests, not a trace of cancer. Amen. Why? It was a spirit. Now, listen, it was a spirit that had access to his life because of disobedience. It had access to his life because of disobedience. It was obedience that broke it off of his life. And so when we don't obey God, we don't know what we're opening the door to. This was a powerful man of God, laying hands on people, they being healed, delivered all around the world. But an act of disobedience opens a door. Did God put it on him? Absolutely not. But it allowed the enemy to have access to his life. And so when people hear the very word cancer, that fear grips them. And it's hard to be in faith when you have been gripped by fear. No, Mr. Tracy has had to fight that demon three times. You say you had to fight with everything in you. She said you can't give up. It's like it wants you to give up and just let go. Say so you have to literally fight. Every minute of the hour, you have to fight this thing. You have to fight your mind. You got to fight this spirit because that spirit is telling you you're going to die. You're, gonna, you're not going to make it. You're going to leave your kids. You're going to leave your family. You're going to die. That's a spirit. And, and the reason why we know as a spirit, because so many people have been healed and seeing the, the spiritual manifestation of that thing leaving their bodies, whether it be in the form of frogs or whatever, snakes or whatever. People have literally seen these demons come out of people that they have cast that spirit out of. And so there is a spirit of infirmity. That's why you don't get at ease in Zion. When things start, you, you know something not right with your body. You start having chest pains, you better rebuke the spirit of heart attack. You better take authority over that spirit and plead the blood over your heart and your health and counsel that assignment. The devil will try to kill you. I was listening to this pastor um, this, this week and say Sunday at one of their campuses, uh, a man had a heart attack and died in the church. 
because the title was uh, brought back from the dead. So I thought they were praying him back. But she was like, no, they got the defibrillators out and they worked on them and got them back. And he, when the ambulance got there, he was joking like, did I disrupt the service? Well, however you get back, get back. But, but I'm telling you, they say if you can take an aspirin when you feel a heart attack coming on, it could save your life. Well, uh, the blood of Jesus is greater than aspirin. The power of God is greater than an aspirin. So how much more so if you plead the blood and you take authority over that spirit that's trying to make your chest tighten up? He was in the church when this happened. He wasn't at the club. You just doing great all of a sudden out of nowhere. Something started going on with your body. You better take authority. I wonder what this is. Why, what you wondering for? It's not a gift. It's not a gift. You don't have to wonder. You take authority. And get away from people that's talking sickness all the time. Well, you know, big mama had dementia and her sister had dementia. And you know, it run in the family. No, it don't run in my family. Why? Because I've been regenerated. I got a new gene pool in me. Diabetes running in the family. Well, it ran out when it bumped into Jesus. You better stop embracing these spirits of infirmity that has been passed through the bloodline. He has redeemed us from the curse. I could stay there, man. I got the move. So that was the spirit of infirmity. Acts 16, 16. We know this. We've been hitting this scripture a lot lately. You should know about hard by now. You should be like, I know what that's about. Unless you haven't been paying attention. Acts 16, 16 says, Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. So, there is a spirit of divination that is connected to the occult and fortune telling. Reading palms, tea leaves, crystal balls, stargazing. We, we got into all of this stuff. So people that are trying to predict the future by all of these occultic activities. So there is a spirit of divination. It's running rampant in the church. And the church has no discernment. So we just embracing everything. These so-called prophets going to Africa, flying over there, meeting with witch doctors, getting potions, coming back, drinking them before they take the platform. And they start knowing this stuff because demons are snitching on you. And then we like, oh, they're a great prophet. Because we have no discernment. So it's a lot of divination in the church palm reading in the church and the church just so gullible and vulnerable just oh right that man was minded and used of God he was used of a God but he was not used by Yahweh because <laughs> I mean true prophets we dealt with this Sunday I believe Thank you for watching Transforming Lives. We hope that this message has been a blessing to you. Our mission is to raise up a body of believers that demonstrates the power of the word in every arena of life. Sowing a seed to our ministry will help to fulfill our mission. There are multiple ways to give to WLCI. You may text to WLCIG to 54244 or give through our website at www. Dot wordlifecenter.org or you may also send a seed offering to Post Office Box 293, Kannapolis, North Carolina 28082. The Word of God says, Give and it shall be given unto you. Thank you in advance for supporting Word Life Center International. Hello, I'm Apostle Jeff Sanders of Word Life Center International. 
And I want to invite you to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life. If you haven't made this decision, I promise it's the best decision that you've ever made. And I just want to encourage you to pray this prayer with me. It's real simple. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God, that you died on the cross, and on the third day you got up with all power in your hand. I ask you to come into my heart. I receive you as Lord and Savior of my life. Forgive me of all my sins. Cleanse me with the precious blood of Jesus. And Father, I vow to serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, you're saved. Now you need to take the next step, get connected to a Bible teaching church. Uh, wherever your area is, find a church that teaches the uncompromised word of God. If you're anywhere within driving distance of Word Life Center International, we would love to have you right here at 1124 Rosewood Avenue. And if you need to reach out for prayer or anything, the information is on the screen. Let us know that you received Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life. We don't have any way of knowing how to pray for you or that you've made this decision if you don't reach out to us. So I encourage you to do that today. And until next time, remember to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We are children of God. How do you know you're a child of God? His spirit will bear witness. Listen, if his spirit not bearing witness, you might not be a child of God. You might be a church member. This, this scripture right here, in, early in my walk with God, when I woke up days, I ain't feel saved. His spirit bears witness. Is his spirit bearing witness, yeah? So what, how you feel got to do with it? You do realize that how you feel has nothing to do with your salvation. Because the devil say, do you feel saved today? No, I don't feel So How do saved people feel? We here at WLCI would love for you to come visit us where our pastors, Jeff and Michelle Sanders, teach the uncompromised Word of God. Their mission is to raise up a body of believers that demonstrate the power of the Word in every arena of life. Come visit us at 1124 Rosewood Avenue in Kannapolis, North Carolina. From the author of Occupy comes the new bestseller, Capacity. The ability to hold and handle what has been given. Order your copy of Apostle Jeff Sanders' newest book, Capacity, now available at Amazon.com. Capacity is available on paperback and also on Kindle. Let's stay connected. We have multiple ways for you to connect with us. Please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. For more information about our ministry, visit us online at wordlifecenter.org or call us at 704-298-0845. Thank you for joining us today in Transforming Lives. We pray that the message has blessed you and that it has pulled you closer to God and His Word. Until next time, remember to be transformed by the renewing of your mind.